glorious day that will be when Christ comes back and we rise to meet him in the air. And if you know Christ as your Savior, you can look forward to that day with the sense of the reality that you will rise to meet Christ. But without Christ, you will not rise to meet him in the air. Without Christ, you'll spend an eternity in an awful place the Bible calls hell. We celebrate Christ tonight. I hope you're trusting in Christ as your Savior. If you would like a, an outline for tonight, you can just on the website, on our website, click there on where it says to download the notes, and you can have the notes, the outline for tonight. But let's pray together, can we? Join me in prayer. Our Father and our God, we look forward to that day when Christ does come back and we rise to meet him in the air and to be with you for all of eternity. But until that day, you've called us to live lives that honor you, and part of that is being patient. So I pray tonight you'll take us back to your word and take us, help us to understand patience and what it means and how to begin to develop it in our lives and examine this aspect of our lives as to how patient we really are and how much we walk by the Spirit. So come tonight, speak to us. Unless you come and speak, nothing will happen. So I ask you to speak in Christ's name. Amen. Well, I wonder tonight, as you look back over the past week, how patient have you been? I mean, really, how patient have you been? Maybe the best thing to do is to ask somebody or the people you've been around this week and to ask them to be honest with you and to share, how patient have I been this past week? Patience is something I think that is rare in these days. This virus thing has caused, I think, a great deal of impatience or causes impatience to be seen so much. I've never seen a time when people seem to be in such a hurry to go nowhere and so much that people are just hurrying around in life and they're just impatient, I think, because of the virus. But you know, we really were impatient before the virus came. It's been a tendency in our lives, even as believers in Christ, I think, to be impatient. And yet the Bible would declare that the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, and then patience. And so if the Holy Spirit is dominating in our lives, then there ought to be a sense of the fruit of the Spirit patience there. In fact, one of the very real measures of how spiritual we are is how much we display the reality of patience in our lives. So let's talk about patience tonight. We started last week in looking at patience, and if you have the outline, allow me to just go through it briefly to remind us of where we've been. We start off by looking at the room number one on the outline. The result of the Holy Spirit dominating in our lives is the fruit of patience. And that is if the Holy Spirit is truly dominating our lives and leading our lives, then that fruit of the Spirit patience will be there. We saw that God is a patient God, and we looked at verses last week that describe him as being patient. You might find, uh, instead of the word patience in the scriptures, the, the word long-suffering referring to God, but it's dealing with his patience. And then B on your outline there in the Roman number one, if patience is of God, then only God can truly produce such patience in us. It's the fruit of the Spirit, the result of the Spirit working in our lives. But then we also looked at D there on the outline, not only is it the result of the Spirit working in our lives, but we are commanded by God to be patient in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 14 and other places in the Scripture. It's a command of God, just as much a command of God as any other command. Just as much a command as do not kill, God commands us to be patient. And so if we are impatient, then that means we are violating the very command of God for our lives. That's how important patience is. Through the Spirit, but also a command of God. And we said if it's that important, then we need to understand the meaning of the word patient. There are different words in the New Testament for the word patient, but in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 22, it's a compound word, macrothyma. Macro meaning long or far, and thyma meaning temporary emotions. So you put those two words together, and it means a, a holding of our emotions, a holding back of our emotions, especially anger and frustration. That's what the word patience there means. It deals especially with anger and frustration, and so it's a holding back of our Emotions, especially anger and frustration, it means not responding quickly. Not responding quickly, but a holding back of our emotions. What it comes down to is instead of responding by our emotions, it's allowing the Holy Spirit to control us in our response. We saw and see on the outline there, it can be translated as long suffering, suffering under long, having that 
willingness to suffer under something or under someone for a long period of time. It implies a willingness to wait, which we're going to see again tonight, and often a willingness to wait upon God to work or to move or to fulfill his word. E on your outline, it's a patient temperament under various kinds of pro- provoc- provocation, meaning that you can't, patience is not something you have just from isolating from people. It's something that we practice by being around people, and we practice and demonstrate that patience. And F, it's a habit or a way of life. No one is born with patience. It's something that we have developed over a period of time or the Holy Spirit has developed within us over a period of time. Which means no one can say, you know what, I don't need to be patient. It's just the way I am. No, you choose to be patient. I am patient, and we'll look at that tonight. But G is important on our outline. It's not a suppressing of emotions, but a restraint. Patience is not a pushing down of our anger and our frustration, our emotions. That's unhealthy. That's unbiblical. Nor is it a denying of our emotions. That's unbiblical as well. God created us as emotional beings. But patience is a holding and control of those emotions. And it's not, we talked about last week, not a sense of calmness on the outside, of pretending on the outside that we're patient while we're raging in on the inside. I probably got more comments from last week on that fact and uh, that part than anything else in our look last week. People said they were surprised and they, they found it interesting that just having a calmness on the outside and not calm on the inside is not patience, but it's not a patience. Patience is being calm on the outside, but it's also being calm on the inside. From there we move to Roman numeral three and the fact that God demonstrates patience or long suffering. You can go back to Exodus chapter 34, verse 6 on Mount Sinai when God passes in front of Moses and declares himself to be patient. And throughout the Old Testament scriptures, you find God declaring himself and demonstrating himself to be a patient God. And then we came to E there under Roman numeral 3, and we said that God displays his patience with salvation. And we looked at different verses that speak of the fact that God offers to us forgiveness of our sins. We are separated from God because of sin. But God offers to us the forgiveness of our sin through Christ because he died with our sins and the punishment and the wrath for our sins upon that cross. And God is waiting in patience, waiting for people to come to trust in Christ as their Savior. But one day, God's patience will run out and God will one day judge people because of sin and their lack of trusting in Christ as their Savior. So God's displayed his patience with salvation. That's where we ended last week. And so we want to begin tonight on F there on the bottom of page 3, that God displays his patience with our sin. He displays his patience with our sin. That is, as believers in Christ. And when we talk about this, we're not talking about our salvation, but the sin that you and I commit daily. Look there under F, number 1. Often he, God, does not discipline us for our sins. The book of Hebrews in chapter 12 speaks of God disciplining believers for their sin. When, when we do not turn from our sin or we do not acknowledge our sin, then sometimes God will bring a discipline, a difficulty into our life to get our attention and to get us to turn around from our sin. But as number one says there, often God does not discipline us for our sin. That is, each time we sin, we don't find God disciplining us. But number two there under F, there may come a day when God's patience with us as believers with our sin will run out and God will bring a discipline into our lives. Just as a a father disciplines his children if they do not turn around from their disobedience, so too one day God may have to discipline us to get us to turn around. But often God does not discipline us when we sin. He's patient with us because of his grace. But imagine, what if each time you and I sinned, God disciplined us? God brought a difficulty into our life, a pain, something into our life to get us to turn around. Imagine what that would be like. Because let's be honest, we sin daily. We struggle. First John chapter 1 speaks of that. We all continue to sin even after our salvation, and we will until we go to be with Christ. We sin, and we probably sin daily. And aren't you glad that God does not discipline us each time that we sin? He's patient with us and treats us with grace and patience. 
And you say, well, Pastor Larry, what's that got to do with our patients? Well, sometimes we fail to treat other people with that same grace and patience that God has shown us. Sometimes God may be patient with us and and show us grace, but we are slow to show that same patience and grace with other people. And I think it's because we hold people to a higher standard than God holds us and the people. And our standard that we often hold people to is perfection. Do you know where impatience comes from? Do you know why we are impatient? Because we expect people to be perfect. That is, we expect them to be like us, to act like us, to do what we want them to do, and to do it the way we would do it. And we expect them to be perfect. And when people are not perfect, then we become impatient with them. When actually, if we have experienced the very grace of God and patience in our own lives with our sin, then we should show them the opposite of impatience. We should show them patience. That is, if we have experienced God's patience in our lives, that is, he doesn't discipline us daily because of our sins, then we in turn should turn around and show that same patience and grace to other people. And instead of expecting them to be perfect, we should allow them the very grace that God allows us. In fact, I would encourage you, challenge you, the next time you start to get impatient with people, stop and ask yourself, am I holding this person up to a higher standard than God holds me? Am I expecting them to be perfect? And what if God treated you and me the way we treated other people? What if he was impatient with us just like we are impatient with other people? I think if we could understand that and begin to practice that in life, that patience with people and that grace, I think it would change us completely. So God demonstrates his patience towards us and he does not discipline us for our sin. Not every day. And then you move to G, and it says God, dis- God displays his patience through the person of Christ. In fact, Jesus is the perfect example of what it means to be patient. And I know he was God come in the flesh, but he was also fully man, fully God and fully man. And if you go back and you read in the Gospels about his days, you'll find his days were filled with people and demands and things to do. From early in the morning to late at night, people were always around him wanting things demanding things, arguing with them sometimes. But you will find that Christ never once displayed impatience because he never allowed the busyness of the day, the responsibilities of the day, and the demands of the day to determine who he was and what he did and his responses to people. Instead, Christ allowed his heavenly Father and his heavenly Father's will and timing and honoring his Father to determine everything that he said and did in life. And the result was that he was the perfect example of a life of patience. And I think that's an important lesson for us. Because if Christ allowed his heavenly Father to guide his every step, and that's what brought about patience in his life, then we have to ask, who or what's guiding my day, your day? Who or what determines what you and I do? We're going to come back to that in just a little bit. But I think often we allow ourselves to become impatient because we allow the busyness and the demands of life to determine what we do and determine our responses to life. And the result is impatience, but not Christ. God demonstrated the characteristic of patience through Christ. And that leads to H on your outline there. The conclusion we come to is that patience is an attribute of God. It's a characteristic of God of who he is but it's also what he demands in your life and mine. And so I thought, if you move to Roman numeral four on your outline, I thought if God demands of us patience, and if impatience is disobedience to God, then I thought tonight maybe would take a little bit of time to stop and ask, what leads us often to be impatient in life? We know we're called to be patient. We know that impatience is sin, basically. So what is it in your life and mine that causes us to be or leads us to be impatient? I thought of just a few things. This list is not exhaustive. But see if you find these things evident in your life often leading you to be impatient. 
Look on your outline there. The very first thing that I list there for of what leads us to be impatient are people. And I think if you were here tonight in this auditorium, this sanctuary, and I were to ask you, how many of you, the number one thing that leads you to be impatient in life and in life as people, I think every hand would go up. In fact, I've heard it before, if it just wasn't for people in life, we would be okay. We would be patient. If we just didn't have to deal with people, you know, if we could just somehow go away to a deserted island somewhere, then we could be patient. Well, that's not reality. And as we saw earlier, patience is lived out among people, so you, you can't get away from people. But people, I think, are the number one cause of leading us to be impatient. So I asked the question there in A on your outline, why is it so hard for us to be patient with people? Why is it so hard to be patient with people? You ever stop and think about that? Why is it that we have such a hard time being patient with the people in our life? And I think the answer is because we place expectations on them. We place expectations on them of what we think they should do and when they should do it and how they should do it. Meaning that we want them, as I said a little while ago, to be like us, to be perfect and to do what we want them to do and when we want them to do it. And when people don't act the way we expect them to or we want them to, then we get impatient with them. And I think that's where most of our impatience comes from from people not doing what we want them to do and when we want them to do it and how we want them to do it. But look at B on your outline. God calls for us to be patient with people. And he does. He calls for us to be patient with people. Let me read to you Colossians chapter 1, verses 10 through 11. In fact, let me start in verse 9. Paul writes to the church at Colossae, and he says, For this reason also, verse 9, since the day we heard of it, of their salvation and of their lives. We have not ceased to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of God's will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding so that you will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord to please him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God and strengthen with all power according to God's glorious might for the attaining of all steadfastness and patience. It's rather interesting. As Paul writes to the church at Colossae, he says, you know what? Since we heard of your salvation, we have not stopped praying for you. And we pray that you would be filled with the knowledge of God and who he is and of his will for your life. And you would be filled with all wisdom and understanding, but that also you would walk in a manner worthy of of pleasing to the Lord. But we also pray that you would be patient with other people. I find that fascinating that Paul lists patience with his prayers for the church at Colossae, these great things he's praying for. And Paul says, I pray you'd be patient with people. It's the same thing that is true in our lives. We are called by God to be patient with people. And yet the number one cause that leads us to be impatient is people. And yet God says you've got to be patient with them. And so if God wants us to be patient with people, then see on your outline We've got to stop and ask the question, if we are impatient with people, then who's the problem really with? Who is it? When we get impatient, who is the problem really with? And the answer is us. We are the cause of impatience. Now, we think people make us impatient, but we choose to be impatient, as we're going to see in just a little bit. The reason we get impatient with people is because of us. It's our fault. In fact, look at the number two cause there on your outline. Number one is people, but number two, what leads us to impatience very often is a focus upon ourselves. That is, at the core of impatience is a focus upon self. The root of impatience is self. In other words, patience flows from a focus upon self and a focus upon our plans our wants, our rights, and our demands. Almost all of our impatience goes back to those things and a focus upon self and what we want and the way we think life should go and how we think people should be. But you know, when we have that focus upon ourselves and how we think people should be and how we think life should go, what we are really doing as we focus upon ourselves and become impatient with people is that we are taking the place of God. 
we are taking the place of God in the lives of other people. And we are basically declaring, I am at the center of life. Not God, not other people, but me and my desires and my rights and my demands and my wants. And patience is really declaring life is about me and my wants and my desires. It's a focus upon self. And when you start to think of patience being a focus upon self, then suddenly that brings it very clear when we are impatient with other people. It's not about them. It's about us. You know, this virus, as I said earlier, has caused a great deal of impatience among people, or maybe brought out a great deal of patience among people. And I love to watch people. I, I, I love to go to the store or other places and just watch how people respond, how they act. And what I find with people in the midst of this virus, what you keep seeing and hearing over and over again is people describing their needs and their wants and their rights and their survival. It's been interesting. The focus is off of other people in many ways. It's become upon self. And sometimes even in our lives as believers in Christ, our focus becomes upon us. We take the place of God in the lives of other people. and We say, it's about me and what I want. But look at B there on your outline. Galatians chapter 5 and verse 16, the verse we started this series on looking at the fruit of the Spirit. In Galatians 5 and verse 16, Paul says, But walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. Paul says, if you walk by the Holy Spirit, then you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. And if you go back and you look at the, the desires, the deeds of the flesh that Paul mentions there in Galatians chapter 5, verses 17 and 19, I think it'll come to the conclusion that the foundation of every one of those desires and deeds of the flesh is a focus upon self. It's a focus upon self. The deeds of the flesh come about because we focus upon ourselves. And Paul in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 16 says, walk by the Spirit and you'll not carry out the deeds of the flesh. In other words, number one, under B there, to walk by the Spirit is to get the focus off of ourselves and onto the Holy Spirit. And therefore, the only way to get rid of impatience in our lives is to get the focus off of ourselves and to place it upon the Holy Spirit. In fact, number two there under B, when we get impatient, we need to stop and ask, where is my focus right now? Is it upon self or upon the Spirit? Am I placing myself at the center of life or am I placing the Holy Spirit at the center of life? If our focus is upon self, then I guarantee you we're going to be impatient and show impatience. But if our focus is upon the Holy Spirit, then it will change us. And we'll begin to see not impatience, but patience. So the second cause of what leads us to be impatient is the focus upon self. Thirdly, the third cause of impatience are the trials of life. And I'm going to come back to this in a little bit as I'm going to come back to many of these things as we look at the cures for impatience. But a cause of often of impatience in your life and mine are the trials of life. And the reason why there under A, we have expectations of what life should be like. In fact, if you go back to that whole concept of what I talked about just a little bit ago, that at the center of life, we place ourselves as being God. And we would never say that, but we, we actually practice that. And if we are at the center of life, then we think, therefore, life should be the way that I want it to be and the way I expect it to be, which means a life with no problems and no trials. That's what every person wants. We want a life without problems, without trials, without pain, without difficulty. And as the God of our own life, we think that's the way it should be. Then look at B. Therefore, when trials come, what is our, often our first response? It's, God, get me out of this. This shouldn't be in my life in the first place. This trial, this difficulty shouldn't be there. It's not the way I had planned out life. I never expected or planned for trials in my life or pain or difficulty in my life. 
And so we begin to see trials and difficulties as an enemy. We begin to get frustrated with them. We get impatient with them. Why? Because we think they should not be here in my life. But look at C. Yet God allows trials into our lives for a reason. There's a purpose behind it. To teach us and to build into our lives what God could not do otherwise. In other words, trials and difficulties in life are like a teacher or a gift to us from God. To build into our lives. That's what he says in James chapter 1. Brethren, count it all joy and you fall into various trials, knowing that the trying of your faith builds patience. That is, God places trials in our lives to build patience and to build our character in our Christian lives. So we shouldn't see trials in an, as an enemy. But we ought to see them as something that God has sent into our lives to build into our lives. In fact, look at D there on your outline. Our impatience at trials shows a lack of faith in God. A lack of faith in God. Our impatience at the trials of life actually show a lack of belief in God that he knows what is best for our lives. In fact, when we are impatient in the midst of the trials of life, what we are basically declaring is, God, you don't know what you're doing in my life. Your plan for my life is not good. That's what impatience shows. When just the opposite ought to be true, as we'll see in a little bit. Instead of responding with impatience, we ought to respond with patience in life. So the third cause leading us to impatience are the trials of life. The fourth cause of impatience in our lives is when we fail to walk with God. That is, when you and I fail to walk with God on a daily basis, then often the result will be impatience in our lives. I have there on your outline Amos, Amos chapter 3 and verse 3, which says, says this. Can two people walk together unless they be agreed? That is, can two people walk in life unless they're heading in the same direction? And I often will use that verse in marriage counseling to help a couple to understand that they can't be going in different directions in life and having different plans and ideas. They've got to be walking together, heading in the same direction in marriage. But you know, it's true in life with God. If we are to live the life that God has called us to live, then we need to walk with him and to walk together through life, meaning we must have a time with God daily where we're spending time reading the word of God and we're spending time in prayer with God, finding out God's desires for our day and for our lives. In fact, I have there on your outline, B on your outline, in that daily walk with God, think about the things that we gain from God. Just think about it. In that daily time, that quiet time, that devotional time, whatever you want to call it, that we have with God daily, just think about the things that we gain from God. We gain direction for our day, what God desires for our day, his plan, his will for our lives. We gain his wisdom through that quiet time each day from God. We gain wisdom for choices and decisions for life. We gain his help during that time. It's that time alone with God in that quiet time that we gain his help for our day. We also, in that quiet time, we gain a sense of who God is, of his sovereignty, his power, and his faithfulness, and his goodness in our lives. In other words, it's in that daily time with God, that daily walk with God each day, that we gain everything we need for life. And when we fail to walk with God daily, we miss out on all those things that we need to live that day. And isn't any wonder, if you could look back over your life and the days when you've been impatient, I wonder how many times as you look back over that day that you failed to have time with God to walk with him that day. You see, if you leave God out of your day, if you leave that quiet time, that time with God out of your day, don't be surprised as you go through the day if life doesn't suddenly be, seem to be overwhelming and the pressures and the demands overwhelming. It's because you left him out of your day and out of your life for that day. So the, the fourth cause of what leads us to often to impatience is that we leave God out of our day. The fifth cause of what leads us to impatience is when we are tired spiritually, physically, emotionally, or mentally. And I think this is one we don't often think about in life, but it's very true. A, on your outline, when we are tired, it seems much harder to be patient. You ever notice that? When you're tired, it is much harder to be patient with people in life. 
because you don't have the strength to handle the people and the situations and the demands of the day. And so the natural thing is to go into impatience. You find that, I think, an example of that is B on your outline, Elijah in 1 Kings chapter 19. You go to that portion of Scripture, you'll find that Elijah, he, he's had a, a battle with all the false prophets. He's been running for a, almost a day from Queen Jezebel, and Elijah's exhausted physically, emotionally, mentally, spiritually. You find an impatience in Elijah there. But he's not alone. You can go back to the life of David, and if you were coming on Wednesday nights or watching on Wednesday nights two years ago when I went through the life of David, and as we examine the life of David, you know that Saul, King Saul, began chasing David, trying to kill David. And David, under the midst of all the pressures of Saul trying to kill him and trying to get away from him, you find David reaching a point where he's physically, emotionally, mentally, spiritually, he's worn out in life. And if you remember what happens, David became impatient. And he says, I'm going to die one day by the hand of Saul. So he, he runs, he flees to the Philistine territory to Gath, the home of Goliath, the one he had killed, his enemy. And he gets there, and the people recognize him as being the, da- the, the warrior who killed Goliath. And David's afraid he's going to lose his life. And so he, he panics, and he acts like a madman there. And be- all of that, I say, it comes back to the fact that David became impatient. He forgot the very promises of God that he was going to be the next king. And if he was going to be the next king, there's no way Saul could kill him. What led him to be that way, to be impatient? He's worn out physically, emotionally, spiritually, and mentally. And when you're worn out, you don't have the energy or the strength to be patient. You know, in my own life, I can almost guarantee it, every time that I get impatient with someone, I can look And right before that, I'm tired. I'm worn out. And so I just encourage you in the midst of this virus, in the midst of everything going on, if you're tired, if you're worn out physically, emotionally, mentally, spiritually, be careful. It's a major cause of impatience. And then the last one, the number six on your outline there, the sixth cause of impatience is when we have to wait. And as I said last week, we hate to wait. We hate to wait on people and on God, and that's often when we become impatient. Well, those are just some of the causes of impatience. They're, they're not everyone. But what I want to focus upon the rest of our time is how do you begin to develop patience? We've seen it's of God. We've seen that it's a fruit of the Holy Spirit. We've seen that God has commanded us to be patient. We've seen also that we tend to be impatient. And as we do, we sin against God by that impatience. So how do you change that? How do you begin to develop patience in your life? Well, look on your outline. Let's look at these tonight. Number one, you need to rest in God. That is, you rest in the reality of who he is. Patient people are people who not only know who God is, but they rest in life based upon the reality of who he is. And I've got two things down there of the reality of who God is. A, on your outline, they rest in the reality that God is sovereign, that he reigns, that he rules, and he's in control of life. And you say, well, why would that be so important with patience? Because when we fail to rest in the sovereignty of God, when we fail to rest in the fact that he's in control of life, when we fail to do that, then who has to be in control of life? That's right, we do. When we fail to rest in the sovereignty of God and his control over life, then somehow we feel like it's up to us to handle life. It's up to us to make life work and to make people work out the way that we want them to to work out. So we begin to play God in life, and we, in our days, try and make life work and try and make situations work and people work out the way we want them to. We're playing God. And when you play God, that means all the pressures, all the demands, all the weight of life are upon your shoulders. And many people right now are carrying the weight of the world in the midst of this virus, trying to make life work out, trying to handle it. And when you play God and all the pressures and the demands and responsibilities of life are upon your shoulders, and you know what happens? You get frustrated and impatient. You can't handle it. We were never meant to be a God. Instead, when you allow God to be God and you believe that 
God is God and you rest in the reality that he is sovereign, then you know what? All the pressures, all the demands, all the responsibilities suddenly are no longer on your shoulders. They're on God's shoulders. And then you can rest. You don't have to make life work. And when you rest, then you can find a sense of calmness, a sense of patience in life. So patience comes from resting in the reality of God's sovereignty. Be on your outline. It also comes from resting in the reality that God is good, that he is a good God. And therefore, anything that God allows into your day and mine tomorrow is going to be good. It's what God thinks is best for us. And he will handle it. And if you and I can rest in that reality that God is sovereign and God is good and anything he allows into our life or anyone he allows to come into our life tomorrow, that it is good, what's best for our lives, and he will handle it and take care of it, then you can rest with patience in that reality that tomorrow is in his hands, that he's the Lord of the universe. So step one to developing patience is resting in the reality of who God is. Step two in developing patience, on your outline there, is to seek God's will for your day and for your life. Patience comes when, when we seek God's will for our days and our lives. Look at A there. Impatience, on the other hand, often comes when we push our plans and our ways into life as opposed to God's ways and his will. In other words, when we focus on what we want and our plans and our desires, not God's. When you do that, you know what it often leads to? It leads to a, a life that's overly busy. It leads to a life that's overly committed. It leads to a life that's kind of out of control. And when you have that kind of life, you're going to feel worn out. And I talked about that just a little bit ago. When you are worn out in life, you're going to become impatient. And that's what happens when we focus upon our plans and our ways for life. Look at B there on your outline. It says the Greek concept of worry it deals with, it describes a pulling apart of the mind. That, that's what the Greeks thought that worry was, a pulling apart of the, of the mind or the emotions or the heart. They saw it as opposing forces inside of a person, pulling a person this way or pulling a person that way. They're pulling the person apart. You ever feel that way? You ever feel like the demands and the responsibilities of life are pulling you apart? When you feel that way, there's no calmness in your soul. And the result is impatience. I have Matthew chapter 11 down there. Let me read it to you. Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 through 30. Christ is speaking, and he says these words. He says, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Now, I think Christ is talking about the, the burdens that people were placing upon others in, in his day of, of, of works and things of how to reach God, but I think he's also talking about life. And he says, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden in life. All you who feel like, the, like your, your souls, your mind, your heart is being pulled apart. And he says, I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon me and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart. And you'll find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. light. I think what Christ is saying, you know what? Let me guide your life. Take my plans for your life and for your day, and when you do that, you'll find it's easy. You're not going to feel like you're being pulled in all directions. I, I like to think of the plan of God and the will of God for our days and for our life like a, a pie. Pastor Ed, what's your favorite pie? Apple. So if we can think of life like an apple pie, and Pastor Ed wants a bigger slice, I imagine. He'll take the biggest slice. But imagine your life being like a pie and divided up into different pieces, and that represents each area of your life. There is a, a, a part there for your walk with God daily. There's a part for your family. There's a part for your church, for your job, for recreation, relaxing, and for people. But life is divided up into pieces. And with each piece, there's time and energy for everyone and everything. That's the will of God for your life. That's what he desires for your life and mine. He, he doesn't desire that our lives be confused and running this way and that way like a chicken with his head cut off. 
He wants us to develop his will for our lives, to seek his will. Because in his will, look at D on your outline. When we seek his will, his way for our lives and for our days, there is balance in it. There is a calmness that comes. When we seek God's will for our lives, there is a balance to life, and therefore there is a calmness to life. And when you have that balance and calmness in life, there is patience. But when you seek your ways and your will, and you allow the day and the moment and the pressure and the demands of people and responsibilities to determine your life and your days, there's not going to be a calmness there. There's not going to be a balance Instead, what's going to be there is impatience. So I ask you tonight to ask yourself a question. If you feel like you're an impatient person, stop and ask yourself, is there any area of my life that's out of balance with what God desires for my life? Any area of my life where I'm focusing more upon this area than what it's supposed to and less upon this area of my life? Any area of life out of balance with God's will? The step to building patience in your life is to allow to seek God's will for your life and for your day. Step number three, to develop patience in our life, we need to pray for patience. We need to pray for patience. And as somebody reminded me recently, what we often pray for is, God, give me patience and give it to me now. (laughs) That's how we often pray for patience. Just give it to me. But that doesn't work, does it? Patience isn't an instant thing as we saw last week. It's developed in a life over time as the Holy Spirit works in that life. But we ought to be praying for patience and asking God to build patience in our lives. But look at A. That's a prayer that we tend to never pray. You know, as soon as we say, you know, pray for patience, we don't pray it. Why? Two reasons. Number one, because we know what's going to happen, don't we? As soon as you pray for patience, what's going to happen? You're afraid God's going to answer it. And he's going to bring some kind of trial into our life or difficulty or pain because that's how God often will build patience in our lives. And we want no part of trials or difficulties and pain. So often we don't pray for patience because we're afraid God will answer our prayer. But you know why else we don't pray that prayer for patience? It's because if we prayed that, we have to give up control in our life and stop playing God. When you pray and say, God, build patience into my life, then what you're really praying is saying, God, then I release my hand over my life. I give you control. God, you do whatever is needed to build patience in my life. And you're giving up control, and we hate to give up control in life. We want to rule our own lives. But look at B. Yet that's a very spiritual prayer to pray for patience, since patience is a fruit of the Holy Spirit. That's a spiritual prayer. That's a prayer that God would delight to answer in your life and mine. Because actually, you and I cannot be the person God desires unless we are patient. It's a fruit of the Spirit. It's a command of God to be patient. And therefore, as I said earlier, the measurement of your life and mine, of our spiritual lives, is how patient we are. So this is a very spiritual prayer. To pray and say, God, develop in me the fruit of the Spirit, patience. I want to be the person you want me to be, and I cannot be the person you want me to be unless I am patient. So, God, develop it within me the fruit of the Spirit, patience. I'm going to ask you in a little bit to join with me, and we're going to pray that prayer together. But step number four, the key to developing patience, number four, is to remember that patience is a choice. Patience is a choice. And I think this is an important one and one we don't often think about in life. Look at A under number four. It says, people and situations do not make us impatient. Instead, B, we choose whether or not we respond with patience or impatience in every situation. And those two things are true. Now, we like to blame people for our impatience. And we say, he makes me impatient or she makes me impatient or this makes me impatient. That's not true. That, that, that mindset is a, what's called a victim mindset. It, it, it means we are controlled by whatever people do and say or whatever happens in life. It's a, it's a victim that says, you know what, I, I can't help but be impatient. It's not my fault these people make me impatient or this situation makes me impatient. I'm just a victim in life. I can't help but be impatient. And that's foolish. 
we are not victims in life. We are agents in life. By agent, I mean we choose what we do. We choose our every response. A victim says, I can't help it. It's based upon other people. An agent says, no, that's not true. I, I am free to choose what I want to choose in life. And I choose, a, an agent says, I choose at this moment how I will respond and how I will act towards this person or this situation. An agent says, you know what? It doesn't matter what this person says or does or how they are. It doesn't matter what happens in life. I choose my response. And therefore, I choose to be patient. And when you understand that patience is a choice, just as impatience is a choice, if you, are, are, you, if you and I are impatient, it's because we choose to be impatient. And when you understand that, that we choose, that's a freeing truth. It is. You and I are free tomorrow. We are free tomorrow to respond with patience, or we are free tomorrow to respond with impatience. But we choose. You know, I came across what someone has written. It's called The Choice, and I think that makes this point clearly. It actually goes through all the fruit of the Spirit, but let me just read part of this. He says, it's quiet. It's early. My coffee is hot. The sky is still black. The world is still asleep. The day is coming. In a few moments, the day will arrive. It will roar down the track with the rising of the sun. The stillness of the dawn will be exchanged for the noise of the day. The calm of solitude will be replaced by the pounding pace of the human race. The refuge of the early morning will be invaded by decisions to be made and deadlines to be met. For the next 12 hours, therefore, I will be exposed to the day's demands. It is now that I must make a choice. And because of Christ, I'm free to choose. And so I choose. I choose love. No occasion justifies hatred. No injustice warrants bitterness. I choose love. And today I choose to love God and the people that God loves. I choose joy, he says. I will invite my God to be the God of my circumstance. I will refuse the temptation to be cynical, the two of the lazy thinker. I will refuse to see people as anything less than human beings created by God. I will refuse to see any problem as anything less than an opportunity to see God work. Then he says, I also choose peace. I will live forgiven. I will forgive so that I may live. And then he says, I choose patience. I will overlook the inconveniences of the world. And instead of cursing the person who takes my place in line, I'll invite them to do so. Rather than complain that the wait is too long, I will thank God for a moment to pray. And instead of clenching my fist at a new assignment, I will face them with joy and courage. In other words, I will choose to be patient. And you and I choose today and tomorrow and every day and every moment. It's not what a person says or does to us. We choose to be patient or impatient. Step number five. To develop patience in our life, we need to see every trial as a time to learn from God. I talked about this just a little bit ago, but I want to say it a little bit more, if you will. Patience comes when we see every trial as a time to learn. I said earlier, we, we see trials as something that should not be there in life. We, we see them as being an enemy. This is not supposed to be in my life, so we become frustrated at trials, and we become impatient with them. But what if we saw life like a school, that's A on your outline, as God's classroom. And every trial that comes into our lives as a teacher sent from God, maybe even as a, our own private tutor, sent from God to teach, and to teach us and to build into our lives what God desires to teach and build us, and that he could do no other way. If we begin to see trials that way and the difficulties of life that way, it would change our entire perspective. And suddenly we would not see trials as something unwelcomed in our life. We would begin to see them as a valued friend, a valued teacher, a gift from God. And the result would be patience and not impatience in our lives with trials. You know, Job was a man that obviously went through many, many trials. His family's lives were taken. His possessions were all gone. He was reproached by his wife and friends, and he was challenged to curse God. But Job would not curse God. Instead, he would see trials that while they are awful, yet he would see them as a being allowed by God. Listen to his words in Job chapter 23 and verse 10. He says, but God knows the way that I take. 
And when he has tried me, I shall come forth as gold. God knows the way that I take. He knows the trial that I'm going through in life. And when he has tried me in the midst of those trials, I shall come forth as gold. In other words, Job would say God would use the trials of his life to build into Job's life, but also to bring God glory. And I think if you and I would begin to have that mindset about trials, in the midst of trials, it would develop patience within us. We would be a lot more patient people that whatever trial or difficulty comes tomorrow, tomorrow into our lives, we would say, this is from God. And see on your outline, we would begin to ask, God, what are you trying to teach me through this today? What are you trying to teach me through this problem in my life? What are you trying to teach me through this trial, this difficulty in my day? And when you have that perspective, then you'll begin to see those trials not as an enemy, not as frustrating, but as something sent from the hand of God to build into our lives, and you'll begin to view them with patience. Step six on your outline there. Step six towards developing patience in our lives is to learn to be content in life. To learn to be content. The Greek word for contentment means to be satisfied, to have adequacy, a sense of sufficiency. And in, from the Christian realm in the Bible, it means to find that sense of satisfaction, and adequacy, and sufficiency in God. In fact, someone put it this way. They said Christian contentment is the God-given ability to be satisfied with the loving provision of God in any and every situation. Christian contentment is the God-given ability to be satisfied with the loving provision of God in any and every situation. In other words, contentment is that sense of being satisfied with wherever God has you in life and whatever you're facing in life at any given moment. It's the belief that I'm right now, I'm right where God wants me to be in life and he's doing what he wants to do in my life and he is adequate for this moment, whether it's a good time or a bad time. And you say, well, why is that important with patience? Well, look at A on your outline there. Contentment breeds patience, but a lack of contentment breeds impatience. Now, why would that be true? Well, think about it. Contentment says, I'm satisfied with where I'm at. In my heart, in my soul, it's at rest. I'm satisfied with where I'm at in life and where God has me and what he's doing and satisfied with the sense that God will handle it. And therefore, my soul, my heart is at rest. And if our soul, our heart is at rest, then there's going to be a sense of patience in our lives. But discontentment, on the other hand, discontentment says, I'm not satisfied with where I'm at right now in life. I'm not satisfied with what's happening in my life. I need something more, something better, something different. And for my heart to be at rest, I will not be at rest until I have this or do this or possess this, whatever it is. But my heart will not be at rest. And when your heart is not at rest, there's an impatience in your soul. And that impatience is going to come out in life. Because you're saying, you know what? I want something. I need something. Until I get it, I will be impatient. Do you see the difference? Patience says, I'm content with where I'm at in life. Impatience says, I've got to have something more to be satisfied. I've got to have something different. One is at rest. The other one is at unrest in life. One is patient. and One is impatient. So how do you change that? You learn to be grateful for where you're at in life and what God has given to you at this very moment. And you thank God for where you're at. It's that sense of, God, I thank you that I'm right where you want me to be at this moment, whether things are good or things are difficult. And I'm grateful for where you have me at life. And I don't need anything else to be satisfied or contented in life. I'm happy with where I'm at right now in life. I don't need anything more to be contented and satisfied in life. You know, there's an old saying that goes, it was spring, but it was summer I wanted. The warm days and the great outdoors. It was summer, but it was fall that I wanted. The colorful leaves and the cool, dry air. It was fall, but it was winter that I wanted. The beautiful snow and the joy of the holiday season. It was winter, but it was spring I wanted. The warmth and the blossoming of nature. 
I was a child, but it was adulthood I wanted, the freedom and the respect that goes with adulthood. I was 20, but it was 30 I wanted to be mature and sophisticated. I was middle-aged, but it was 20 I wanted the youth and the free spirit. I was retired, but it was middle age I wanted, the presence of mind without limitations. And suddenly my life was over, but I never got what I wanted. Interesting. Patience comes when we're satisfied with where we're at right now. That this is where God wants me to be for this season of life. And I will find rest for my soul at this season. I'm almost out of time. Be patient with me. and Give me just a couple more minutes. Number seven, be grateful. Step number, step number seven, develop patience in life. Be grateful for God's grace. And I've already talked about this tonight. If God has been patient with us by his grace, then we ought to begin to show the same patience and grace to other people. When we are impatient with people, then we are either ignoring or forgetting about the grace of God and his patience in our own lives. You want to become a patient person. Then begin to ask yourself, do I treat people the very same way that God treats me? Step number eight to developing patience is to practice being patient. Practice it. Patience is something that's developed in a life over a period of time as you practice it. So how do you practice patience? Well, easy. You put yourself in a situation so you have to be patient. I was trying to do this recently at the grocery store and getting in the fastest line. I forced myself to stand in the slowest line behind the person with all the things in their cart. Why? Because I would tell myself, okay, Larry, we're going to develop patience here. So you put yourself in situations where you force yourself to wait. And as you do, you'll begin to develop patience in your life. Step number nine to developing patience is to have realistic expectations for the day in life. Don't expect tomorrow to be perfect. Don't expect life to go perfectly. Don't expect people to be perfect. That's unrealistic. Lower your expectations down. Hope all goes well, but you know what? Even if it doesn't, you say, that's okay. It's still a pretty good day. But lower your expectations for people. Allow them the grace to be imperfect in life. Finally, step number 10. If you want to develop patience, you walk by the Spirit. Because the fruit of the Spirit is patience. And it's what the Holy Spirit develops in our lives as we walk by the Spirit. So see on your outline there in number 10. If we are impatient, then we need to stop and ask ourselves, am I trusting in myself and not the Holy Spirit to live out life? Because walking by the Spirit means you're trusting in the Holy Spirit to live out life. So if you're impatient, you've got to stop and ask, am I trusting the Holy Spirit to live out life or myself? Number two, in what area of my life, if I'm impatient, in what area of my life am I not walking in the direction the Spirit desires me to go? If you and I are impatient, there's some area of our life that we're walking in a direction the Holy Spirit doesn't want us to go. And thirdly, in what area of my life is the Holy Spirit not dominating me right now? If patience is a fruit of the Spirit, then when we are impatient, it means the Holy Spirit is not dominating some area of our lives. And so tonight, if you and I are struggling with patience, then we need to stop and ask ourselves the question, is there an area of my life that is not under the Holy Spirit's control? Well, Roman number six on your outline, how would you rate the fruit of the Spirit patience in you tonight? Zero on there, meaning no patience, and 10 meaning completely patient. Where would you put a number on there? And then ask yourself some questions. What tends to lead you to not be patient in life? What is it? I gave a short list, but what are some things that lead you not to be patient? Be on, your, on the outline there. What person or people do you tend to not be patient with? We tend to have some people in our lives and some situations that we tend to be impatient with. So who in your life do you tend not to be patient with? A wife? A husband? Children? People at work? See, what do you need to see change to be more patient in your life? What needs to happen to the things we talked about tonight? That the Holy Spirit needs to change in your life and mind for us to be patient. And finally, D, I wonder, would you pray for the Spirit to build the fruit of patience in you? Would you join with me right now and do that? And Pastor Ed, I'm going to ask you to come and the other pastors as we prepare to pray. But I'm going to ask you, if you're watching, listening, would you pray with me right now?
And I wonder if you would join with me in just saying, God, I don't have the fruit of the Spirit patience evident in my life. And God, I ask you tonight to begin to develop that spirit of patience in me, that fruit of patience. Show me why I'm impatient with people in life. And God, show me what I need to have changed in my life to be patient. And God, begin to work in my life and develop this fruit of patience within me. Would you pray that with me? And then as you're praying, I wonder tonight, I talked earlier about God's patience with us in salvation, that God is waiting for us to come to trust in Christ as our Savior. And he is. You know, the Bible says that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That means every one of us, we've sinned against God and we've fallen short of what God desires for our lives. And the Bible says that sin, Romans 6, 23, separates us from God. God is a holy God. And he cannot allow sin into his presence. And because of our sin, we are separated from God, facing eternity in an awful place the Bible calls hell. And there's nothing you and I can do about it. Not being religious, not going to church, not being baptized, not being a good person, not even being patient can regain that relationship with God. But the good news is that Christ died on that cross with your sin. He paid the penalty and the judgment for your sin and mine. And he offers to you forgiveness of your sin tonight if you'll trust in him as your Savior. And the Bible says that we trust in Christ as our Savior by faith. By faith, we receive his free gift of salvation. And you can do that tonight right where you're sitting. And so tonight, if you would like to know that your sins are forgiven and that you have eternal life with God, that you want to trust in him as your Savior, I'm going to ask you to pray with me right where you're sitting and say, Dear Jesus, I confess to you that I am a sinner. And I confess to you that I am facing an eternity away from you. But I thank you for dying with my sins upon that cross and paying the judgment and the wrath for my sins. And right now, Jesus, I trust in you as my Savior and Lord. And the Bible says if you're sincere in that prayer, then right now your sins are forgiven. And right now you have eternity with God. 